Good day everyone, welcome to the World Water Day 2020 from the University of Birmingham. We're going digital, uh, as, as we all know, under these circumstances it's very difficult to gather a lot of people. Um, nevertheless, I would like to give a talk, this time via uh, Pronopto. Um, I am a, I'm Doris Vent, I'm a PhD student, uh, a PhD researcher at the University of Birmingham, Physical Geography. Um, and my work is supervised by Anna van Loon, um, David Hanna and John Bloomfield. I'm part of the CENTA cohort um, and there's additional support uh, for my PhD by the GDI and the British Geological Survey. Um, for the ones that directly want to go on to the next video, I mean, you might, you might be interested too, um, the take home message is that droughts will become more severe during climate change and I will show examples around the world of drought impact, resilient management and adaptation um, of groundwater droughts and droughts in particular. Um, and what we try to do is we generate knowledge to increase the resilience to extreme droughts. So we look at adaptation of water use, but particularly new management strategies um, uh, for droughts and increase uh, water recharge where possible. So what are droughts? Droughts in a natural environment is practically a sustained dry period compared to normal. That means if there's no snow or rain, you will talk about a meteorological drought. If there's dry out soil, it will be a soil moisture drought. And uh, low uh, uh, lake levels or uh, very little flow in the water uh, in the stream, uh, dried up springs and lowered groundwater levels, they are hydrological droughts. Uh, and you see an example of the dried up lake here in the picture and the Victoria waterfalls um, in December uh, last year. In the human modified environment, however, we uh, consider different aspects of these droughts. So, for example, a soil moisture drought is also called an agricultural drought because the agriculture is badly affected by uh, the lack of soil moisture. Reservoirs are included in hydrological drought because they uh, are not only places to swim, but also stay in our drinking water. And there are lots and lots of things that are affected during these droughts. Droughts occur naturally in each climate, so it means it's a natural hazard. The impact to us is however different. So with various um, levels of exposure, vulnerability and adaptation um, to these droughts. And then you include uh, climate change impact into that equation, um, which reduces, uh, we will see that as a uh, precipitation reduces in many areas in the world. So that means we need to think of a different um, intensity of rain. Maybe rain only falls in a month rather than a whole year, or in a week rather than two months. And that means that our current water uh, uh, water systems are going to change, our water resources might need to change for, for that reason too. On top of that, we have the increase in evapotranspiration with a hotter climate, plants in general, and actually people also need more water. And all in all, it results in more severe droughts. So drought in the Anthropocene, we don't only study the natural variability, but we also look at um, meteorological, soil moisture and hydrologic drought, and especially that human activity part, so land use, irrigation, dam building and water restriction. What are our responses and how, how are we resilient, or perhaps we're not? Um, and how do we adapt to uh, droughts? So the drought impact and the exposure is uh, shown on this map uh, by Caro uh, in, in 2016. Um, and exposure and vulnerability you can approach in many ways. So you look at the social component, the economical or maybe the infrastructure, but the adaptation is key um, to, to see what is going to happen and how we're going to respond, if we respond well to extreme droughts. And I would like to give a couple of examples of my own research. Um, uh, in collaboration with a lot of people. Um, and I would like to start in Ethiopia. This was the first time I experienced a very severe drought. I was working there as an irrigation um, specialist. And we had to map the irrigated area at the time. 
Um, during the summer, it was very clear from the weather in the first place that it was exceptionally dry. Um, however, during the survey, we saw, well, as you can see, the rivers running very low. Small streams were left over, whereas normally it would have a big, vast amount of water coming through them. Water, uh, people tried to collect water in those yellow water buckets. Um, and um, we can see the tanker in the river by trying to pump and collect water for villages that are further away from the stream. Later in the year, we we know we uh, heard that the UNHCR um, uh, published that seventy uh, that eighty percent of the harvest had failed due to a lack of rainfall, um, and we saw during the mapping of the irrigation scheme also that the, the irrigation was well you can see most of the lands were fallow uh, in, the, in the area so we were in the north um, and uh, the irrigated area shrank uh, drastically it resulted in a lot of hunger um, over 10 million people which is a tenth of the population in Ethiopia um, received a human turn eight for, for food and that shows that this is uh, that Ethiopia wasn't very resilient to drought. The drought happened. It was an event which um, was uh, amplified by climate change, um, and and the population massively struggled. So ways to um, uh, increase that resilience. Uh, is, is, it's important to study those ways and it's important to look at different sources of water, alternating sources of water, um, trying to reduce the water use um, and, and include that in the management. So another example I would like to show is uh, different sources of water. So for example, we, in, in with, together with Embrapa, um, we looked at uh, substituting surface water for groundwater and looking if we could maintain the agricultural production as it currently is using groundwater and if we, and and we saw that that was possible given the model which is a, a bit simplified but um, the first the first results uh, look probable however it wasn't very sustainable in that particular area so it's important to look at alternatives but also to increase the knowledge and look at long-term sustainable solutions um, in areas where the uh, where the agricultural production is 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 a, a very big component of the water use going back to Europe um, uh, I would like to take you to the last drought we had, uh, which was in the summer and, um, and over the winter in 2019. So we saw that rivers dried up, harvest has decreased, actually increased sometimes when it wasn't moist and uh, water limited. Um, and you might remember all the forest fires that occurred over Scandinavia um, and parts in, in England. Um, those are very, very exceptional. Um, so I'm not the only one studying drought, no, far from. There are a lot of people in Europe that look at droughts. Um, there, there is the European Drought Observatory, which is basically a, a, a drought survey, as you might know from the States, or maybe from Australia, or as they said about Latin America. Um, but it basically maps the area and has a combined drought factor, and also looking at precipitation, leaf, uh, hydrology, uh, soil moisture, etc. There is a European Drought Center. That's a knowledge center that has a lot of resources. Uh, there's a new book coming out and software and activities. And there is an academic community, which is actually not European. Um, that's global. But we organize an our workshop and splinter meetings, um, looking at comparison of drought events, conducting a literature review. There is a survey. Um, uh, going around and you have been or you might be contacted for that because we're gathering the, the perception and the um, and the risk that you have experienced during the last drought. And the last component is uh, at the moment is the drought policies and that's the uh, bit of research I'm involved in. Because the drought because the drought policies across Europe are were developed as part of the European Water Framework Directive with the aim to, uh, to protect both water quantity and quality and actually move away from that emergency response might be disastrous or very productive 
but to look to go towards the planning. So drought plan should involve um, an early warning system, regular drought monitoring, indicators, and mitigation strategies, mitigation measures. Um, and Julia Urgeo and and her colleagues they compared six drought events on both local scale, regional, and national scale, um, and she found that the countries that are in the the largest bubbles, basically, as they blow up, um, countries with um, the most effective uh, mitigation uh, drought plans uh, had a strong history in water uh, regulations. So it doesn't mean that areas where it's most dry have the best plans. Um, and and uh, but she has all she had also um, made a long list of recommendations and the mitigation measures. Um, the, the extent of the mitigation measure and the, and the um, recommendation, therefore, is, is impressive. Um, these measures were not compared directly, and that's why my research comes in. So I look at um, the mitigation measures as they are documented using a model simulation, and that's basically um, national or regional drought plans, looking at the trigger levels, when are they active, when they're not. Um, mitigation measures and how they impact the drought relatively. So if during a once every 10 year drought there are different measures active and how they would preserve or maybe use certain water resources more. Well, this research is ongoing. Uh, contact me if you are very interested. And it's part of the European Groundwater Initiative. So we are gathering together with the BGS and the University of Birmingham a lot of data about groundwater in Europe, um, looking at groundwater time series, but at policies and risk impacts, um, trying to map those drought characteristics and see when, uh, when they occur, what the timing is and magnitude, and if that changed over time. Um, the image you see uh, with the yellow to red stripes is from England. Uh, and that's not surprising um, because in England we have a highly managed uh, water system uh, that's been studied intensely. So I'd like to take you to England for just uh, a minute or so. And during the last drought, we could see that the land use and that the landscape has changed, so from green to uh, all the green fields became brown. Reservoirs dried up or were very, levels were very, very low, and rivers shrank drastically. And if we look at the meteorological drought, so the lack of rainfall, we see that it was extremely dry um, in the southeast. And actually, that was not only two years ago, that was also during the last drought event. The area that was prone to drought is in the same place and didn't um, differ that much. It's quite important to know that the resource availability in that particular area is also very low. So it means the water is there, but it's all being used. There's no excess of water available. All the water has been licensed, over licensed, or even over obstructed in some areas. Um, and that means there's a need for care for water management, whether it's surface or groundwater. But if we look closer, we see that a lot of this water is actually groundwater fed. That means that we need to know how these ground, how these aquifers are managed, and what the influence is of our management practices. So we looked into the near natural droughts across these aquifers. So the blue triangles are the near natural sites selected by the BGS, and the red dots um, vary basically between being very close to that near natural to being very, very much um, uh, influenced by water use, being possibly very close to obstruction locations. And we see that if the obstruction on the, on the long term is smaller than the recharge, we see smaller drought events, so they happen very often, uh, more often compared to near natural, for example, when the water, in, uh, water use increases. Um, but they're very shallow, and they recover quickly. When water use approaches the water availability, we see these lengthened droughts. So they smoothen out, basically, and they recover naturally during um, wet years, um, but they take much longer to recover. And if we look uh, across the world, we have examples where water use exceeds the availability on the long term, and then we very often observe those lowered groundwater levels um, 
for um, that indicate a heavily stressed aquifer or over uh, exploited aquifer. Groundwater drains then don't recover naturally or only under very uh, exceptional circumstances. One of these examples would be the Central Valley, where um, the heavily stressed aquifer there is marked by lowered groundwater levels, actually subsidence because of the removal of water and the unstable, very young aquifer makes that this uh, surface sinks um, by the loss of volume. So how are we thinking of mitigation strategies for droughts when the water volume and the water levels are um, uh, declining so drastically? So one way would be to reduce water use. Uh, another way would be, or perhaps we need both, um, would be to increase the water recharge. So we looked into that managed aquifer recharge, which is practiced for over 60 years um, in California. Uh, so there's a map down in the slide uh, that indicates the MAR facilities. Um, and most of them are operational for the last 10 or 20 years. And we looked at how that affected the groundwater droughts um, uh, in temporal and spatial regions. And we saw that when you recharge water in these big facilities, like you can see in the bottom, uh, you can overcome short dry periods, but on a regional scale, if you operate it for a long time, it really mitigates drought. The um, other, uh, this is very new research. Uh, I just came back in December uh, last year uh, from South Africa. And I've been conducting research with IMI, which is the International Water Management Institute. Aquifer recharge in South Africa is fairly new. Um, has been practiced some years uh, in, in particular places, and we look towards the in increasing resilient water system and mitigating droughts, um, especially triggered after day zero in Cape Town. So in this particular area, which is the Limpopo Basin, we're looking to recharge with treated wastewater, see if that could result um, in a more resistant water scheme. So one way would be to increase water use, uh, water <laughs> recharge and to reuse, uh, reduce water use. And one of the most exceptional examples I've seen so far of reducing water use is in a very small country um, or territory in the Palestinian territories. They have a very complex water situation both politically and in the climate. In the Mediterranean uh, droughts are increasing, hot periods are extending, becoming more and more extreme. Um, and when the availability of water resource, water source is not great in the first place, these long droughts mean drastic um, water shortages. And one way you can adapt is to store water during wet periods and to use it during those sh uh, long periods of water shortage. Or um, so, for example, you see the two men mounting a, a system on a water system on top of their apartment. And if you look across the city, there are lots and lots and lots of these black systems. Um, they become very warm, actually, in summer, so you have heated water for free. Um, but they reduce their water use um, uh, drastically by capturing a lot of water and spacing it out over the year. Um, they use about... 60 to 70 litres a day, compared to us, compared to people here in England, that's half the amount um, of what we use. We use about 145 or 150 litres a day. And we don't have, we, or we don't, perhaps we don't need a water system all on our roof, but we can think of little changes in our daily water use, or we can think of a water meter, we can think of capturing the rainwater during, uh, during uh, spring, just to just to smoothen out that increased water use over the season. Right, so water in a changing climate implies that droughts will become more severe due to climate change and has a different impact globally. Careful water management is key, especially during droughts. So how to increase that extreme, uh, how to increase the resilience um, uh, to extreme droughts? Well, it's adaptation of water use. Little changes for everyone will make a big difference on a national, regional or national scale. Uh, we can look into water recharge where it's possible and avoid deterioration of our water at all costs. As Karen illustrated very nicely, 
We cannot drink from this very little water source all at the same time. But once it's polluted, we can also not drink from it. So everyone has a role to play. We cannot afford to win. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm Doris Wentz, um, PhD researcher at the University of Birmingham. Stay tuned for Outputs. Um, as you saw, there's a lot of work in the pipeline and already online. So have a look. Um, uh, I will be online today on Twitter, which is exceptional sometimes, uh, and mainly contactable by email. So drop me an email if you're interested, um, and please get in touch. Thank you very much, and have a good day.